Well, last week we started on a uh, three-week introduction to expectations. What is it that we expect out of life? What is it that we expect from God? Next week we'll be talking about what does he expect from us? We're going to turn the tables a little bit. Uh, we define expectations as assumptions of things that would follow based on information that we have, experiences that we've had, and even our own prejudices. They form the decisions we make. They, they form our expectations primarily on life as we see it through our own eyes. But we found that Christ challenges us to allow him to reshape and even sometimes change our expectations to view life and view our lives and the possibilities that he sees through his eyes. For his disciples, we found out one of the first things that he invited them to was to come and see. He knew what their expectations were. They were somewhat limited. But the invitation to them was, come and see, and I'll show you something even more than what you can expect. And what came out of that was, come and follow me, for I'll make you fishers of men. So we looked at some biblical examples. We looked at John the Baptist. He knew exactly what God expected of him. He would preach repentance. He would baptize until the Christ would be revealed. But we also found that there were some things that John had expected, like others did, about what the kingdom of God would be thinking that it would be brick and mortar, armies and swords and, and chariots. Jesus tenderly let him know that, John, the kingdom that is being brought is seen through what I am doing. The blind eyes are open. The ears, the deaf ears are open. People are healed. The, ra the dead are raised. The gospel is being preached to the poor. The kingdom is advancing because I'm doing what the Father expects of me. I'm going out and about my Father's business. We looked at the Pharisees and we looked at people in general. Jesus asked them plainly, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you expect? Particularly talking about John. What did you go out to see when you came to listen to him? So Christ would challenge everyone, even the Pharisees, what is it that you expect? When he called his first disciples, he raised Andrew's expectations. When the disciples began to follow him, he turned to them and said, what are you seeking? What do you want? What do you want from this relationship? And regardless of how we answer that, the invitation will always be, come and see, I'll show you more. And we saw that same invitation given to Philip, given to Nathaniel. Come and see. Come spend time with me. So how was it that Jesus actually reshaped men's expectations? Well, first of all, he did it through patience and not rebuke. If you look at his relationship with the disciples, most of the time he was very patient, very tender, Come and see, let me show you a different way. Let me show you a better way. As a matter of fact, I can only think of the top, off the top of my head two times when Jesus really rebuked his disciples. One is when Jesus was sleeping in the boat. They're out on the Sea of Galilee, and a big storm blows up. The disciples are afraid. They're going to die. They're going to drown. They wake Jesus up and say, Don't you know that there's a storm while you're sleeping? Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith. That was one rebuke, and he calmed the storm, of course. The other one was Jesus, Peter, James, and John were coming off the mountain after his transfiguration. When they got to the bottom, they found his disciples kind of arguing. There was a man who brought his son that was demon-possessed, and they couldn't cast the demon out of him. And Jesus, frustrated, oh, you perverse generation, how long do I have to suffer with you? But then after that, he kind of tenderly said, you know, really, a lot of times this comes by prayer and fasting. So he was tender again. Jesus would rebuke the Pharisees, however, over and over again, to point out their wayward ways. 
But most of all, it was with his patience and his gentleness. How else did he reshape men's expectations? He did it with simple invitation. Spend some quality time with me. When he called Andrew, he called him to spend time with him. It was probably just overnight. And the very next day, Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter. He does the same with Philip. He did the same with Nathaniel. Spend some time with me. And then lastly, it was the power of his word. And we showed the example of how the farmer sows seeds on the path and on the rocks and in the weed areas, but in the fertile soil, it grew to great expectations, greater than he would even expect. The seed is his word. It's the power of his word that goes out, that changes, that reshapes our expectations. So if lesson one had anything to, to say, it would be Jesus asking us, what is it that you expect of me? What do you want from me? What do you see with this relationship that we have? And regardless of how we, how we would answer it, he would still say, well, come and see, spend some time, and let me show you something more than what you can even believe or even more than what you can hope for. So that was last week. This week we're going to be talking about what can we expect out of this relationship with Christ. But let's pray first. Father God, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for this time that you've given us. We thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your house, to hear your word. And now, God, as we are here, may we step forward with eyes to see and ears to hear. Let them be open, open the, the eyes of our heart that we can see Christ and all that he has for us. One step at a time. Bless your word, O oh God, as it goes out, touches our hearts, that we may not keep it, but to give it away. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what can we expect out of our relationship with Christ? The simple answer, number one, the kingdom, number two, his promises, but I'm not going to let you off that easy. So, you're going to have to wait for it. Jesus, very early in his ministry, would talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, somewhat of a concept that really hadn't been taught before. We heard of God's coming kingdom through the prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, and others. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, being here, what does it look like? What really was it? Well, Jesus went about planting the seeds of the kingdom one by one, in everyone's life that he met, so that they can see the glimpse of what was to come. He made it his purpose to reveal the kingdom of God while he was here. Now his first task, it was important for him to dispel any thought of him becoming an earthly king, and for there to be an earthly brick-and-mortar kingdom. This was not what he was called to do. If we look at John chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, I'll try to say these slowly so those of you who take notes can look at this. But this is right after he feeds the 5,000. John chapter 6, verse 14, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew to a mountain by himself. Jesus knew their hearts. They wanted a kingdom, but they wanted a brick-and-mortar kingdom. He had to do everything he could to resist that temptation. So what did he do? He went away. He ran away. He went into the mountain to spend time with the Father. Because being an earthly king was what he was tempted with at that moment and others. If we remember the time when Jesus spent in a wilderness right after he was baptized, Satan tempts him over that 40-day period. And one of the temptations Satan did was he put before Christ all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, look, these are mine. They were given to me, and I can do what I want and give them 
to whoever I want. Both of those were lies. But if you worship me, Christ, I'll give them all to you. They'll be yours. Wanting to deter Christ from the cross. Anything that would deter him from going to the cross was something that he was tempted with. It's something that he would run from. Now, he was already in a desert at this time, so where could he run? He ran to the word, and he repeated it with God's word. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only. So the first thing that Jesus did for the kingdom and how he showed it to us was to dispel any notion that it was going to be him being a king sitting on a throne. Even before Pilate, he would say, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were... I would be rescued. So knowing the will of the Father, knowing the expectations of the Father, Jesus resists any temptation to become a king, as we would know it. So if the kingdom wasn't brick and mortar, if the kingdom wasn't going to become like people thought it would be, then what would the kingdom of heaven look like? Where would we look for it? How would we even know it's here? If you will... Turn to Luke, chapter 17. Beginning with verse 20. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. Where is the kingdom? Now some people will mistake this verse, the kingdom of God is within you. He's talking to the Pharisees. Was the kingdom of God within them? Nah. If you look at the original writings, the best interpretation of this is the kingdom of God is among you, or the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, they were looking for the kingdom of God. They were trying to calculate it, figure out when it's coming. Jesus said, hey, guys, it's here already. He's standing right in front of you. Look no farther than looking at me. Because what they would see in Christ was just the beginning, just a foretaste of the kingdom of God that would be shown to men. Jesus also made a point in Matthew about the kingdom of heaven. Remember, we talked about his words about John the Baptist last week. And in Matthew 11, verse 11, I tell you the truth, among those born of women there is none risen, anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been moving forcefully and advancing forcefully, and the forceful men lay a hold of it. Guys, Pharisees, people, the kingdom of God is here. It's in me, and I'm going to show it to you little by little. But it's moving fast, and it will take men of will. It will take men of courage. It will take men of vision to grab a hold of it. So get a hold of it now before it's too late. So where is the kingdom of God? How do we look for it? We look for it in Christ because it's there in its fullness. It's there in its completeness. Does he show it to us all at once? No. If he did that, he would totally overwhelm us, would he not? He'd be overwhelmed by the full countenance and glory of God, but a little bit at a time, giving us just what we need every day to move forward instead of back. So, is the kingdom brick and mortar? No. Where do we look for it? We look for it in Christ. Well, how do we even get in it? How do we enter the kingdom of heaven? In Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, do not think, he starts with the law, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter Not the least stroke of a pen by any means will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not even enter the kingdom. How do we get into the kingdom? It's through righteousness. But it's a righteousness that he would provide, not that the law would provide by its letter. And the Pharisees would follow the letter of the law forever. But they would not follow the spirit of the law. And this was the distinction. If you think you can get into the kingdom through the righteousness established by the law and the righteousness followed and taught by the Pharisees, you're mistaken. It's the righteousness that is only provided through Christ himself. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, the kingdom of God. Not brick and mortar, found only in Christ. That's the only place we need to look for it. We enter it only through him. So Jesus would go on to plant more seeds about the kingdom, and he would ask, how can I compare this, or what can I compare the kingdom of God to? So he begins, if you want, turn to Luke chapter 13. He's talking about the mustard seed and the yeast. <clears throat> Luke chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus asks, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again, he asks, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked its way all the way through. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, day by day, glimpse by glimpse, piece by piece, would permeate itself through us. The mustard seed, I've never seen one. They say it's small. I've never physically seen a mustard tree. They say they're big and bushy and spread out. The kingdom of heaven, once it's placed in our hearts, will grow like a tree, expanding throughout all of us, every part of our life, not just a little corner that we designate it to, but all of it. But we have to allow it. Okay. Just like yeast. Anybody bake bread? Anyone make pizza dough like I try to do? <laughs> All right. If you want a nice crust that's a little bit thick, you put yeast in your dough. If you give it more time, like stick it in the fridge for a couple of days, it'll actually give you more flavor. So that's from an Italian. But anyway, the yeast permeates itself through the dough. You get the picture. If we allow it, this is what the kingdom of God will do. This is just a foretaste of the Holy Spirit and his function and purpose in his life. If we allow him, he will permeate through our lives. That's glimpse number one. The farmer who sows the seeds, we mentioned this already. There's a farmer who was out sowing seeds. Some of it fell on a path and it got trampled on. Nothing became of it. Some of it fell on rocky ground. It grew up, but that had no root. It withered away. Some of the seed fell among the weeds, and it got choked out. Okay? But other seed fell on fertile ground, and it took, and it grew a hundredfold, a hundred times what was actually planted. The seed is the word of God. The kingdom of heaven is empowered by Christ's words. It was his word that creation happened, right? None of this existed before the words went out and the worlds and the universe were created. It's his word that breaks the chains of the bondage of sin. It's his word that moves mountains. It's his words that meet greater than the expectations we will ever heard. The power of the word of God power of the words of Christ. The kingdom of heaven is empowered by his words. Luke 15 gives the parable about the woman who loses a coin. I think you all know it. She has ten silver coins. 
This may be all that she has. She loses one. She's lost a tenth of everything she has. So what does she do? She stops what she's doing. She lights a candle. She sweeps the floor until she finds it. His word says, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found my lost coin. Those who seek the kingdom of God will seek it diligently. The houses back then probably didn't have windows. They had no lights. They had dirt floors. She would not stop looking for what was lost until she found it. If we are going to expect the kingdom of heaven open up to us, we have to diligently, diligently look for it, seek it, and not until it's found, but to take it even further, as Christ said, forcefully move the kingdom of heaven forward. She saw the great value in her coin, did she not? She wasn't about to lose it. And this is the other way that we can look at the kingdom of heaven. It's valuable. Why risk losing what we've been giving? Similar parable that, that Jesus gave was also Matthew 13, <clears throat> verses 44 through 46. He tells the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and he bought it. Again, he's telling us of the value of the kingdom of heaven. We should be willing, therefore, to give everything that we have for it. And so what he's asking us here in these parables, are you willing to give up what you have for me? What are you willing to give for me and to follow me? It's somewhat reminiscent of the story that Jesus told about the young man who came to him. And he said, good teacher. What do I have to do to enter into the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, well, the commandments. Do you follow them? Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. Do not defraud anyone. Do you honor your father and mother? And he said, I've done all these since I was a young boy. And Jesus, remember, looking into his heart, he said, there's still something that you need. See, Jesus didn't ask him all the commandments, did he? He only gave about five or six. And the guy says, yeah, I do all these. He says, there's one thing that you lack. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Follow me, and you'll have treasures in heaven. Ah, he hit a sore spot. Because the first commandment about loving God, serving God, only him shall we serve, he was serving his wealth. He was serving his riches. And he walked away despondent. He walked away with his, his, his heart broken because he was holding on to the one God that he had, his money. Okay. What will it take for us to gain the kingdom of heaven? It takes us being willing to give up those things that are so important to us. They're temporal anyway. But Jesus promises, give it away. Give it up. Give me all the rooms in your heart. Not just the four or five or six, but I need all ten of them and more. Okay. Are you willing to do that? He asked the young man that question. He asked us the same thing. So those are just a few glimpses of the kingdom of heaven. The one thing that Jesus would use to change our expectations and what we could expect from what he was giving the other thing that we can expect from him and from the relationship that we have with him are his promises. And the promises, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on a few of them today, a few of them next week. But the first one that should come to mind is our salvation. Okay? It's a promise of God. All of us know John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
we realize that our salvation itself is an outgrowth. It's premised on God's love for man. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't have gone to the cross, right? But he loves us, and that's why he went to the cross. It was out of his love for us. But don't forget verse 18 that follows. He said, those who do not believe are condemned already because they haven't accepted the only begotten Son of the Father. So it comes freely as a gift, but it's certainly dependent on our choice to accept that gift. So salvation. We touched on Isaiah 53 last week. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely the chastisement that brought us peace was, beyond, was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Jesus paid it all. Completely. There was nothing left other than Christ's sacrifice. <clears throat> First Corinthians 118. I'll read that for you. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And skipping down to verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Our salvation is his promise. It's through the cross that it was accomplished. It was through the cross that we had our, salva our salvation. And without the cross, there would be none. And without the resurrection, there would be no hope. Also, regarding our salvation, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to deliver us from all unrighteousness. The promise is there. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, all of us know this, verses 8 and 9, that our salvation is a gift from God, given to us through his graces, but also through our faith not of anything that we can do on our own. We cannot pound our way into the kingdom of heaven. And this is what Jesus was trying to tell the Pharisees. You won't get it by calculation. You won't get it from doing every letter of the law without the spirit of the law. It comes only through grace. And it's grace through our faith in receiving it. It's a true gift of God. Nothing that we can work for on our own. So salvation... Freely given, paid with a great price, but conditional on our accepting it and believing it and on our part. So salvation is one of the promises of God. Uh, number two, what's our position in Christ? Who are we anyway? What are we anyway in Christ? Second Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17. Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We hear it in the King James, Behold, the old is past. Behold, everything comes new. We are, our position in Christ, a new creation. Someone, something we have never been before. So, when we look in the mirror every day, what do we see? Gray hair, wrinkles, right? Getting older every day. Now, what we should be seeing is the reflection of the Christ in us. And this is what he compels us to be. This new creation doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. Just as we age and take time getting older. The new creation, putting the old man to death each day. Struggling with the old man, do we not? It is a temptation that is there all the time, but he has empowered us through his word to overcome the old man and to adhere to the new creation and be what he has called us to be. So when you look in the mirror every day, say to yourself, I see something beautiful. I see what Christ has made, and let that start your day. So that's typically one of the first things we do every morning is look in the mirror, right? So we do that. 
take an opportunity uh, of it. Romans 8. What else are we in Christ? What is our position in Christ? Romans 8, verse 17. If we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. Number one, who are we? We're his children. Number two, not only children, but we have an inheritance that is awaiting for us. The physical kingdom of God. But right now, we even have the spiritual kingdom of God, which is just one step Closer, is it not? Jesus or Paul also says, and sometimes we mistake this, if indeed we share in his suffering, we will also share in his glory. He's not saying, if you suffer, then you'll share. He is saying, since you are presently suffering, you will also for sure share in his glory. So we have an inheritance. We're his children. Something is waiting for us, but we don't have to wait for all of it because part of it is here even right now. And not only will we, sh will we share in the kingdom, but we will also share in his glory. God owns it. Jesus owns it. But we share in it. It's partially ours. Romans 8, 28 through 31. Something, again, that we all should know or do know. And we know that all things, <clears throat> well, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's a mouthful. Is it not? First, Paul tells us that all things for God's purpose work toward our good. Sometimes we want to slip in our good. Well, our good. How do we know our good unless it's God's good? Okay. He has a purpose to do and to, what to make out of the lives that he's given us. And we can be assured that wherever he takes us is a good place. It may not look like a good place, but for his purpose, for our good, it's the place that he takes us to. And every one of us has a different place that he takes us to. So this is very, very to the point, very specific for each and every individual. And why does he do this? He does this so that through this process of wherever he takes us, he can conform us, shape us into the likeness of his son. And that's what our life's experiences are supposed to do with us and for us. So when you're having a real bad <laughs> and we all have them. Why am I sitting here at this light that is forever in the traffic? I'm jammed and I'm going to be sitting here for an hour. Well, turn it into a prayer session, okay? Spend some quality time with the Lord. Maybe he's inviting us to say, hey, you haven't talked to me for a while. Maybe it's time to talk. You're not going anywhere unless you get out of your car and run or you get your bike out of the back seat and, and drive away, right? You are here for a purpose. So I just preached to the choir, to the guy who needs it, okay? <laughs> because when I'm stuck in traffic, my wife will attest I do not like it, okay? Ah, so why does he do this? Why does he take us places that we don't necessarily like to go in life? Okay? He takes it because he knows what we need and what it will take to allow his kingdom to take light in our heart and our life. So he allows some things to happen so that we can become like Jesus. Did not Jesus go through a lot of tough stuff? Yeah, yeah. 
Did not Jesus bear everything, every emotion that we go through? Yes. So, why is it so hard for us to realize that? That's because sometimes we don't think about it. But he's doing it for a purpose. It's so that he can mold us, shape us, conform us into the likeness of Christ. What more could we ever expect? What more could we ever even hope for? And lastly, he says, if this is all true, if this is God's de design for us, that his purpose would be to conform us to be like his son, who can stand in front of us? Only what we let stand in front of us, right? So he empowers us with this word to overcome what tries to block us in becoming what he wants us to be. Lastly, in verses 37 and 38 of that same chapter, chapter 8, Paul goes on to say, Now in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth or anything in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ our Lord. If we allow it, there will be nothing that can defeat us. There should not be anything that we should allow to take us away from his kingdom. He empowers us to be conquerors. Okay, that made sense to these people. He's writing to the Christians in Rome. What was the power in Rome? It was Rome. They knew what it was to be like or what it was like to be conquered. Even the citizens, as Rome expanded itself, conquered people. Everyone who would read the letter knew what it was like to be conquered, defeated, put down, stepped on, abused. Paul's telling us we don't have to take that because what really matters is what conquers our hearts. And if it's Christ, then we have everything that we need. He makes us more than the people with the swords and the spears and the guns and the missiles and everything else. Why should we fear it? We have something even more powerful than that. And he goes on to say that there's nothing that can separate us from God's love. Wherever we are, we will find it. Paul didn't mention one other thing, outer space. We've now been there, right? And maybe, maybe, maybe we're going to go there again. No matter how far, he's there with us. And nothing will separate us from the love of God, regardless of where we are in this universe. So these are the promises of God. Every one of them is true. Are they not? Are they not? So in summary, I'm going to let you guys off easy. I told you I wouldn't, but I will. Okay. What are the expectations that we can have in our relationship with Christ? Number one, it's a share in the kingdom. Number two, it's his promises. Christ unfolded when he was here little bits and pieces of the kingdom one at a time and people who would receive it that they could see him and follow him. He does the same thing with us today. He shares the kingdom little by little, day after day, so that over our lifetime, however long we spend with him, it turns into something very beautiful. It turns into that crown that he gives us that someday we will lay at his feet. Is it not? Sometimes our lives seem very mundane, do they not? But sometimes, most of the time, it's the mundane things that we do that really count. Saying hello to a neighbor that doesn't like you. Okay? Opening a door for somebody. Okay? Doing the stuff that we hate to do because we know we're not going to be rewarded for it, at least not here. The mundane things of life, the little tiny things that we can take from the Lord as pieces and parts of the kingdom and then give it away. 
is what he really expects of us. Okay? But we, in turn, can expect that as we do that, that stuff accumulates over a lifetime. Most of us will live relatively long. Okay. So what are you doing with all of those days that he gives us? Are we just going about our own business? Or we go about the Father's business? And I am telling you, I'm preaching to myself again. Because this is what I need. This is what we all need. Those little mundane things that are actually little seeds of the word, of the kingdom that we can plant in other people's hearts. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, and I think you all know this, he goes, right now in my life I'm looking at the kingdom of God, I'm looking at the kingdom of heaven, I'm looking at Christ like I'm looking through a dark glass. Okay? I can only see so much, just a shadow, just a foretaste. But he said the day will come, when I see him face to face, that day will come. He said, I also know, just in part right now, God hasn't revealed everything about his will for me yet. If he did, what would we do with it? But little by little, but someday, then, I will know in full. I'm going to have my questions answered. Why did we go through this? Why did this happen? All of us have whys, do we not? Why? We always ask that. Why? Ah, it's waiting. If he doesn't show us in this life, he'll show it to us in the next. And so this is what Paul is saying. That his kingdom comes one piece at a time. We can only go so far. God will never expose his fullness, completeness to us in this life. We couldn't handle it. It would totally overwhelm us. But this is where our faith steps in, does it not? When we're sick, when we have a financial situation, when things just aren't looking good, this is, okay, God, where's the answer? Yeah, trust me. Come and see. Spend some time. And he does it through our faith. So what we see can only go so far. Our faith is what takes us even further. So number one, the kingdom of God. Number two, our salvation, paid in full by Christ with his blood on the cross and secured by, our by his resurrection. We, see, we receive it by grace, through faith, and in him alone. Christ, cornerstone. We sang it this morning. It's there. It starts there. It ends there. Our salvation has been completed by Christ and Christ alone. Many of Paul's letters would, would have to pound that out because people th would think, oh, we need to do more than this. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to go back to the law and, and, and adhere to the, the law, the prophets. No. It's by faith. It takes it beyond the letter of the law. It takes it to the spirit of the law. Accept it. One thing that we will know through his promises and through his word is that God's plan is always good. That's his nature. He cannot do anything against his nature. And his nature for us, his plan for us is good. His purpose is clear. It's to experience the kingdom of God, even now, one piece at a time. How that unfolds, however, his program, not for us to know most of the time. The details are in his hands. And again, that's where our faith steps in. His plan is good. His purpose is clear. His program, totally up to him. That requires our faith. So, again... When you're discouraged, when it seems like there's no hope, when it's out of reach, when you suffered unbearable pain or heartache, it's these moments in our life that God is actually taking us aside and pounding out his image in us. Okay? I'm conforming you to what Jesus should look like in your life. 
These become then our own stepping stones on our own path, on our own journey to the kingdom of heaven and in the kingdom of heaven. They're all good. They've been planned by God. It's up for us to follow. That's it. Next week, we'll talk a little bit more about his promises, things that we can expect of him and from him. But we'll also look at what he expects of us. Now it's our part. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word, because your word is true. And not only is it true, but it is powerful. And nothing can withstand your words as long as we don't allow it. God, we just pray that we take your words with us each day for the work that needs to be done in our lives and also for what we can pass on to others. Because if they don't see it in us, where will they find it? How will they enter it? How will they know your kingdom for them? It's in Christ's name we pray and we thank you. Amen.